Okay. Tanshi Kiwa, hello, how are you all? Welcome to Homelands, originally broadcast on CFCR Community Radio, uh, 90.5 FM in Saskatoon, Homelands of the Métis and Treaty 6 Territory, CFCR.ca. This is your favorite auntie, Andrea Ledding Dishni Kashun. My name is Andrea Ledding, call me Auntie Andy if you like, and I'll be your host over this next half hour. I am part settler, part relative, and 100% ally in relation to everyone. I'm just me, not a card-carrying member of any Indigenous nation, but I am loved, adopted, related to, and accepted by many, rejected by a few, haters gonna hate, relators gonna relate. I am blessed to have Indigenous relations in my family, and secretly I may love them a little bit more than the rest, only because they are the first peoples of this land who welcome all the guests. But I'm also Irish with some Scandinavian along with a little bit of mystery and that's the way I was raised strongly anti-colonial and justice oriented with a big related heart for all. I most empathize with my Batash Métis friends and family and that history and culture growing up and as an adult I have continued to try to live that meal permit so in that beautiful good life. So from the fringes of the sash I situate myself as a relative and an ally and welcome you my listeners as brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, cousins, in the homelands. So let's welcome our relative tonight. So my brother from another mother here is Joseph Natauhau. And Joseph is an amazing person. Um, let me tell you a little bit about him. Our honored guest is a multi-award winning actor, singer, songwriter, storyteller, and respected cultural knowledge keeper from the Sturgeon Lake First Nation. He's a highly regarded indigenous advisor for many universities, organizations, and communities throughout Canada. He has studied abroad for 15 years with a Buddhist master and many more years with Indigenous elders, making him a much sought after speaker, counselor and educator for youth and adults alike. He is the recipient of a Canadian Aboriginal Music Award and has performed for the Prince of Wales and the Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan. He has acted alongside icons such as Gordon Tatusis and Andrea Nard and received a Gemini Award for his role in Wapos Bay. And if that were not enough, he's also the recipient of the Saskatchewan Centennial Medal for his significant con contributions to society and outstanding achievements. But of all these accolades and acknowledgements, there is one achievement that stands above the rest. He is a residential school survivor. I am very pleased to introduce our special guest as he shares with us his experience and educates us on the significance of different things like Orange Shirt Day in Canada and whatever else he wants to talk about. So it's an honor and a privilege. Welcome, Joseph Natauhau. Thank you, Andrea. Very uh, detailed invitation and also detailed bio. You know, sometimes it's good to listen to where you've been, you know, what you've done and what accomplishments you've made. It doesn't really, uh, like, uh, like my ego is pretty stable, you know, so I don't really, I don't really, uh, I guess, get all excited you know, about where I've been, what I've done. It's just things that happened along the way and as I was as you, like we were saying you know surviving in this land you know through the Canadian education system so you know it's uh thank you for the <laughs> great introduction though <laughs> a great welcome so for the first question I guess like in a few sentences or paragraphs or minutes can you Tell everybody about yourself and the different work you do. I've kind of touched on it in the bio, but do you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah, for the most part, I, uh, I'm now sort of getting into that age, at that age where I'm starting to do more ceremony, more being a, kind of a, um, emerging elder, I say, you know, because you don't want really name label yourself something that you know some might be questioned by a few people so i'm more doing that kind of work but i still have a connection to institutions across canada and saskatchewan also primarily a lot of educational institutions so i still work a lot with young people but lately in the last number of years i've been working with uh, universities you know the university so i've been working with that uh, that audience and that group of people, students, young people. And these would be people, for example, that would be uh, in my time, you know, when I was about 19 or 17, 18, around there. That's when you become an apprentice, you know, to an elder. You start working with an elder and you start studying and training, you know. But I, uh, so 
I'm working with them sort of in that reverse now. So I'm at that point, you know, at that level, in some ways, you know, that I'm guiding these young people through their own lives, you know, uh, but these young people are primarily Canadians, Saskatchewanians, you know, people from Regina, Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, and all over Canada, I guess, and all over Saskatchewan. So I've been doing a lot of that, you know, on uh, Zoom, you know, also just what I was going to Regina for some time. I'm connected with the University of Regina, University of Saskatchewan, University of Concordia, and a little bit of connection with UBC and uh, uh, Simon Fraser University. So I've been working with those institutions for the last number of years. Oh, everything else is in between. I'm still doing the artistic practice. I'm still a musician. I'm still a storyteller. I was doing a bit of acting, you know, for uh, different, uh, probably different uh, um, tribal councils, you know, as uh, I don't know what the narrator, I guess I don't know what they would call it, but someone to play the role of a CEO gone corrupt, you know, or, or a questionable chair. Of the his, his behavior is questionable, so I, I play those kinds of roles as well. So, for governance training, so that's what I've been doing, and then of course, you know, I uh, still do cultural camps. You know, Andrea, I still do cultural camps in the summertime. You know, I go to mm -hmm. Little Black Bear, for example, quite regularly, and not too many actually. You know, but uh, every now and then I get called just to go to a cultural camp. But primarily it's been in the Treaty 4 territory and some Treaty 6. Does that help to give you a little bit of background? Yeah, you bet. I mean, I know you're always busy. You're always doing something. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Can you share with us maybe some of your experiences growing up and how you got to be where you are today? Okay. Well, my first uh, number, a couple of years or a year actually was... Uh, as a teacher in Stanley Mission. I taught there for a year. And that was quite uh, an experience, an opportunity to meet Northern northern family, Northern people you know, up in Stanley Mission, around all that area, and the lifestyle there. Because uh, I left that particular lifestyle on my mother's side many, many years ago. The trapping and fishing, you know, and hunting. All of that was uh, really, Deep, you know, back in the 1960s, you know, and, and onward, you know, but I, you know, I, I, I miss that. You could say the, uh, I miss the uh, intensity of that, you know, the daily going out there, but I experienced par partially some of the hunting and some of the gathering and some of the carrying of the meat, you know, back to the highway, you know, back to the truck or back to the horses. So, you know, back then we would have had horses to carry the meat out of the horse, but it was a moose, right? It was a really heavy duty. So that's, those are some, that's one of the things I remember in my, my life that we used to do. The things that I don't do at all, I guess, is a lot of related to alcohol, right? A lot of, a lot of my uncles and aunties, you know, my grandparents my, and my parents, they were really heavy into alcohol. And that was, uh, that was, pretty well what would happen, you know, when I was at the residential school. So in some ways, it eventually became that I understood that it would be safer to go to the residential school rather than go back home. But the same reason that the residential school was created caused that problem with alcoholism in our communities. But at the same time, change had to happen, right? Some change had to happen because uh, we were still living off the land, you know, we still had access to most of the land in Treaty 6 territory, but the settlers were moving so moving in so fast, as you know, that uh, something had to happen, okay? So they created this law, I guess, this policy to bring his kids into the schools in Prince Albert. And so most of my life, uh, I spent quite a bit at the residential school between 
six, you know, five years old to 18, 19 years old. So that's 13 years or so I spent there. I failed one grade, so I guess it cost me another year, you know, of training. <laughs> it's unbelievable, Andrew, you know, that experience is training the mind, but it's also tormenting the mind and the body and the spirit of, of an individual, totally annihilating you in order for you to lift yourself up out of that torture and suffering, you know, and it's in itself, you know, it's an incredible, incredible training grounds, you know, if anybody, I wouldn't recommend it as, a, as an educational you know, way of being in the future of generations. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want them to do it. I think we were sort of like, uh, in some ways, experimental. You know, we were part of the experiment of this country here. They, uh, I guess, I don't know if they were as much experimenting as us, but they felt like that they were superior, newer, <laughs> inferior. But now with all this that's happening in the world, we're not so fear. We're more or less becoming more, you know, listened to. We're more or less being heard now. We're, they're ready to listen to us because we had a way of living that was actually close to the land. It was close to the way that we need to live now, you know, if not the way that we live now, Everything is all modernized technologies here, which is okay, you know, that's where we're at, you know, but in the end, it might bite us, you know, it might come and bite us in the end, you know, so we might have to think about how, how do we navigate this place that we're in right now? So. What, what began you? I can say at the moment. What began your journey of healing and reconnecting to your roots? The, uh, the time that I turned 19, 20 years old around there, that's when it actually began. And uh, because I was grade 12, I had a lot of uncertainty as to what I was going to do with my life, even though people said, you, you know, it might be a good idea to go into social work or go into education because my mother, my, my father was a social worker. So luckily there was somebody that was on my path, you know, my first wife who kind of showed me the ropes at the University of Regina. And so when I arrived there, I noticed that something deep, deep down inside was missing. You know, I had all this Canadian education. Mind you, I was not uh, a very good student because I was trying to learn the culture and the language, you know, and the value system, all at the same time with a new language, right? With a new way of, with, with still my indigenous background, Nihio, we know Nihio, we went Nihio, and I still had that in my genes, in my blood. So, when I was turned 20, all of a sudden, bang, it's just like a door opened, you know, so this is the door you need to follow, as well as this door, you need to follow these two doors now, because you're going to need this, what you were born into, in order to understand what you experience in this other world, and also in order to survive, you know, it was all about staying above water, staying afloat, because in this world I'd left at six years old, I was completely empty of my stories and songs and anything to do with culture, the roots, even the family system, community way of thinking, you know, how communities worked a long time ago. All that was completely taken away or taken out of my mind, you know, so I had to function using the English language, English culture, dressing like a Canadian, a citizen of Prince Albert. It was confusing times, but what I noticed was there's always a way out. 
there's always a way out to extreme difficulty, whether it's genocide or just displacement or you know, just residential school, as they say. There's always a way out, and that help for me was through singing, through finding my song, which required me to sing and to basically uh, scream, sing out the sound of pain inside my body. I had so much, so much, uh, un, un, I guess, undealt with uh, emotions that were trauma. And I was just traumatized. My emotions were just all over the place. They were never in one place. I mean, they were never congruent. Like I couldn't tell her tell whether I was happy one moment or or couldn't tell when to be angry. It, what joy was about, and I couldn't really tell how to say that I was depressed, that I was in a place of sorrow. I couldn't say those words. I couldn't find the words because nobody really, they don't really teach you. They teach you a little bit about psychology, but they don't teach you how to feel. You know, and I was going through that, the emotional state of my being, right? I was going through that. So the healing had to be confronted with a strong sound, you know, with a strong the strength of our ancestral voice. That's what I could say. Because as soon as I started singing, it felt so good in my body. It's like something was happening in my body that said to me, you're going to be okay. Just keep singing. You know, just keep singing. You're going to be all right. And if you stop singing, you know, you might go back into that trauma. So I sang for years, you know, for the first number of years. For the first four or five years, I couldn't even speak. Like my voice was uh, really weak, monotone. Sometimes I still fall back into that. So I really have to work hard to project. That's why I got into acting as well. But I didn't do that right away. The first thing was just to go into traditional, you know, spiritual, cultural background, you know, and knowledge and skill and all that. So that's where the ceremonies came in. So I went to a lot of ceremonies as well as a lot of social gatherings like powwows, you know, cultural camps. That's what I needed. That was the medicine that I needed to heal all the pain inside, heal all the wounds that I I uh, picked up while I was being in that school. So that's that's what happened. So that's uh, that's how my healing began. Thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask next about the importance of music to your journey, but you've kind of talked about that. Do you want to say anything else about music or sing for us or? Yeah, you know, the, <laughs> sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, the, uh, you know, my first song. And if you sing that full force, it sounds beautiful. It's a very, what they call northern style of singing, which is really kind of like falsetto or, you know, tenor. I'm a tenor. And uh, when I uh, started singing, that's all I did was power music, round dance. I slowly got into it, and also some of the sacred music, the, the sun dance singing, and other more private ceremonies. So I got that's how I started, you know, and I just kept singing. And then eventually, I don't know, because with the my my Canadian side, you know, my Canadian English culture kicked in, you know, it said, well, you know, I'm not totally indigenous anymore. I have, I have this other side that's been brainwashed into my body. It's not going to leave. It's there kind of just, hey, knock, knock, knock. Where are you? You know, we are all one people. We all come from one creation we own. 
It's been a long time since we kissed in the special way. So those kind of kind of music which was similar to the way I was learning singing anyway, you know, it just I made more of a hybrid style of singing. So that seemed to soothe me. And because I was a storyteller, I was aware that young people don't necessarily all want to hear powwow and round dance, you know, every day, you know, when I'm out there, you know, and they also they, I wanted to sing with them, you know, and also wanted to get the message out. And English, a lot of the kids are English speaking, including our indigenous kids, our children, our own Cree children in Soto and Dakota, they were all also in that same place because their parents went to residential school, so they lost their language. So I'd give them something to uh, to listen to that was both coming from both sides of who they are. You know, this new, this new culture, this new way of being. So I just finished a song just lately uh, called Born From Dirt. And uh, it's a single. Because at six years old or five, when I was kidnapped, I didn't remember one. I don't have any memory of that. So I wanted to create a song and I wanted to put it down. <clears throat> it really helps me to write things down. So I write a lot, you know, for some reason, I just like to write sometimes. So I wrote it down and some of the words came out nice and easy, but it took about six months to a year to come up with the first line. Born from dirt in 53, January, still before that dawn. A wild child, I come from the ochre of my mother's heart. No te quil again. Old woman raised. So that was the first verse <clears throat> of this song. And it's finally complete. And it's coming out as a single. So, you know, I'm still working with uh, language. There's some words in there that are in Cree. Thanks to my collaborator, Cheryl Rondell, who wanted to, you know, have me come up with some new music as, a, as an individual, right? We sang together for many years, Cheryl Rondell. And then I had Gregory Hoskins, who's kind of like on the Munio side, you know, the Canadian side, who had the uh, skills to put words together. He was a wordsmith in music. But uh, to get to get anything started in myself, you know, creatively or anything, for anything, sometimes I need encouragement. I need a kick in the butt, you know. And so I've had that all the time. So Cheryl is one who kicked me in the butt. And that had a lot of people like my father who encouraged me. He liked the music, you know, he liked all one people. To, he said, we got to go to the studio and record this. You know, that, that's what he used to say. And my mother, <clears throat> my mother is more, uh, more my stability in who I am. You know, she's very calm, you know, she very, has this calm strength about her, but also very wise, you know, there's a lot of wisdom coming from my mother being very observant. So a lot of part of me is, is uh, shaped by my mother, you know, even though she wasn't in my life, you know, for 15 years, you know, all of a sudden she came back when I was 15 or 16 years old. But for some reason, you know, that it, it, your mother's life, her personality is, is really strong in your, you know, as a young boy. And it's like that as a young man. It's not so much my dad. My dad was not around. He worked. I think I get the working side in my, even though my mom worked hard as well, but my dad always worked. He you know, was kind of workaholic, you know. He, first he was an alcoholic, and then he became a workaholic, and then he put all that alcoholism aside and became a spiritual spiritual alcoholic, <laughs> a ceremonial person, you know, ceremonial leader. That's how mom and dad worked together for the last number of years, you know. 
for a while he was going to go into the ministry. And just like anyone else, you know, who's gone through residential school, there's a, a little message that says, you need to go into the ministry. You need to follow the way that you were trained. You know, people that were modeled, modeled that, you know, the church from the Anglican church. There's a strong message always kind of trying to, you know, really convert you. But there's also this other side, this indigenous nihio, nihio, nihiawi, nihio atapsuno, and the weekly way of being and seeing that was also very strong. That was also very strong, you know, so it actually over, it just overcome, you know, the Anglican spiritual practice. So the, my practice is primarily Nihiawin, the Cree way of, you know, praying and being in ceremony. So there you go. <laughs> Great answer. Um, how did your connection with IISB come about and how are they helping you with sharing your story? Well, I was, I was actually uh, thinking, I had my partner downstairs here, Diana, and I were kind of moving in that direction. And then uh, when I started meeting, you know, uh, Shannon, periodically, you know, and I forget who the other lady was or gentleman, but uh, it's her it's her and Jeff right now who are who are uh, managing this IISB. And uh, but it was Shannon who I met first over the years, you know, she was a runner. I was a runner too, but she also she was uh, going through life in her own way that she was, you know, and she just uh, one day just I guess invited me to come and be part of ISB, and so I thought, well, that that makes sense. I'm ready to uh, get the word out, you know, from from what I've experienced in this life, you know. And uh, so, we, so we got started, and we started developing uh, just uh, bio information. Started developing little uh, mini uh, videos, you know, just little videos just to have included as part of the promotion and uh we had a couple of meetings lately i really like the message that they were giving you know because a lot of the people that are there it's not about making money you know you know it's uh although it is also about that you know but it's about, it's about honoring your your people honoring the life that you have with people that are from different cultures so it's also honoring your honoring your voice honoring the people you come from being a servant, you know, I really like the message of that. I'm, I'm always all about, <clears throat> you know, teaching. You know, there's something that's uh, ingrained in us, you know, from this time that we're small, you know, to carry on the spirit of where you came from. You know, the Nihio, you know, they're always, they're always telling you to, uh, conduct yourself in a, you know, a certain way, right? Properly. So those are the things in order that I, I, I guess grew to understand were important. I uh, also understand the value of money, but I was more initially moved, you know, to uh, just uh, be a storyteller and do the uh, speaking engagement, but it's more comfortable. I was more comfortable with storytelling and singing, that sort of thing. But ISB is actually upping the game, you know, for me, you know, it's like it's helping me to uh, to really put put my story succinctly, you know, and to, put, to tell it's it's a little, maybe it's a little uh, a little more efficient in, in terms of getting the story out, right? Getting my story out and to tell it in a very professional way but also in a very uh, very good way you know because it's not it's not it's not easy to do you know and people want to hear something slick but they also want to hear something with heart and I'm at that point where I've had lots of experience you know with uh, speaking about my life you know my difficulties my challenges and I want to actually share how I overcame that, <clears throat> you know, what were the, uh, I guess, uh, turning points, you know, what were the highlights, you know, what were the uh, actual 
I guess, tricks of the trade, maybe what are, what are the actual, um, actual uh, reasons, I guess, you know, for carrying on. I'm able to do that. I'm able to at least tell people my story and say, this is how I got over this part, you know, this is how I got over the emotional in incongruence in my life. You know, I went to life skills, you know, and I would meet people that were emotionally stable. This is how I got through the family system, that sort of thing. You know, this so I can explain that. So a lot of this stuff, somehow I uh, eventually began to understand Andrew. You know, I just began to understand. So this is what I, uh, I guess this is what I'd like to share as being part of the ISB. You know, I think it's really time to do that. You know, it's time to do that. I've been doing it for a long time. And and be just slugging away with the schools and everything, but it seems like it's time to move into another area of uh, of um, life, you know, that seems to be the right track for me. It's the right path, and I feel comfortable with that. But thank you for asking about that. Mm -hmm. One one final question before we go: What's the main message you you want listeners to take away from today? And are there any resources you'd recommend? Okay, I think the main message is uh, to remain true to yourself, to know who you are, to know where you've been. And um, being an artist, I would say stay close to that heart, you know, because to me, being an artist is the heart of who I am. So I would tell people just to uh, sing, just to dance, to go on the land, you know, and do something, you know, just be part of the land. And uh, one of the three things that they used to tell us, the old people, was, you know, don't, don't just speak for the sake of speaking, you know, because your words are very important. You know, what you have to say is really important. So the other thing is, Watch how you think. Watch how you think, how you use your mind, you know, because your mind is very powerful, you know, it can alter a person's situation, you know, if you think negatively or if you think badly about a person, you know, so just, just watch how you use your mind. And also watch where you go, how you walk. Watch where you where you're going. You know, don't just go because this is sounds like a great idea to go to this place and you know, to do this and that. No, they always caution us. You know, there's places of danger, right? In life, there's places that you don't necessarily want to go, need to go. So be careful. Think. That's for thinking. Right? Thinking about where you need to go. So those are the things I would I would. Uh, like to say you know in my closing statements anyway just uh for for anyone who's listening out there so thank you for this uh brief interview andrew thank you Great thank you joseph again. yeah kishimarsi <laughs> to our relative tonight joseph Natauhau. niwag maganak all my relations and believe me we are all related so act like you've got relations this is auntie andy signing out from homelands originally produced on cfcr community radio 90.5 fm in saskatoon homelands of the metis and treaty six territory cfcr.ca you can find excellent programming on indian and cowboy podcasting follow us on twitter at metis homelands and if you have comments, questions, or guest suggestions, email metihomelands at gmail.com. This email will, this episode will also be viewable on our YouTube channel, Homelands. So subscribe today. Marcy, thank you for listening. And Akoshi Kawapa Matina Wellmino. That's all. We'll see you later. Right on. <laughs>